Tywin was the firstborn son of Titos and Jane Marbrand. When he was born, it was Tywin's grandfather who ruled over Casterly Rock as the head of House Lannister and a warden of the West. His name was Gerald Lannister. He wasn't liked at first for rumors amongst the small folk about him killing his last two predecessors. Gerald would end up being an amazing lord that was responsible for growing their house's wealth and power during his reign. So soon enough, he earned the people's love. It's said that when he first went to ruffle his young grandson's hair, Tywin bit his finger. Tywin would be the only grandchild Gerald would meet. After a long rule, he died from complications with his bladder. With Gerald dead, Titos was next in line to rule as a new lord. But Titos was never expected to take on this rule. He had twin older brothers that died young on the battlefield. Titos was not much of a fighter or even capable at anything. He's honestly described as a pretty nice guy, but that isn't a quality needed in a leader. Titos's trusting nature, eagerness to please, and how easily he forgave others was taking away all the progress his father made for the family. The Westerland lords were taking advantage of their weak liege. Loans were being taken out without ever bothering to repay them. The Lannisters' reputation was fading, as well as their gold. Tywin first showed his strong will when his younger sister Jenna was betrothed to a younger Frey son, something the 10-year-old Tywin protested as a bad match to his incapable father. Jenna was still married to the Frey to Tywin's dismay, and the young heir would be sent to King's Landing to serve as King Aegon V's cupbearer. Soon after he left Castle Rock, Tywin's mother would die after birthing their last sibling. Early into his rule, Titos was commonly called the Laughing Lion for his jovial spirit and for the fact that many laughed at him. But after his beloved wife's death, he was never called that again. It was a toothless lion that he would be known as. After a little while, Tywin and his brothers, Kevin and Tygate, fought well on the Stepstones during the War of the Five Penny Kings. He was knighted at the beginning of this war and fought beside Aerys Targaryen II, the man he would become fairly close with. This war further matured the already mature Tywin. He returned to the Westerlands after his victory in order to undo his father's misrule. While Titos was busy with a lowborn mistress, Tywin took it upon himself to demand all loans be repaid and dealt with the outlaw problem that was rising. One of the Westerland houses realized that the lion was awoken and complied with Tywin's orders. He didn't have the funds to pay what he owed, so he sent his daughter to be a hostage until he could. One family who had been the Lannisters' rivals in the past in terms of power in the Westerlands outright defied Tywin and laughed at his demands. House Rain grew very powerful under Titos. Lord Rain held enough influence at this time to tell other houses to just ignore Tywin. Another family that also grew powerful, House Tarbeck, and this lord decided he would ride to the Castle Rock and speak with Titos. He was instead met with Tywin, who placed him in a dungeon. But in turn, three Lannister relatives were captured. This panicked Titos, and he decided to free Lord Tarbeck and forgive their debts to save his relatives. Things seemed okay, but Tywin was not done. A year later, he ordered Lord Rain and Tarbeck to present themselves at Castle Rock to answer for their crimes. The Rains and Tarbeck's rose in rebellion, renouncing fealty to House Lannister. This is exactly what Tywin expected to happen. Without even informing or counseling his father Titos, their banners were called and the Lannister force was marching for Tarbeck Hall. Without time to prepare, the Tarbeck host was crushed and the Lannisters marched forward to their castle. They collapsed their walls, wiping out the entire family and everyone inside, and then burned down the ruins. The Reigns also tried to fight at first, but were outnumbered and had to retreat back to the castle Castamere. The castle, like Castle Rock, started as a mine. At the height of their power, they were as wealthy as the Lannisters. 90% of the mass of Castamere is underground. The Reigns tried to negotiate some terms. It was well past time for talking. The mine's entrances and openings were sealed by Tywin's men, and the castle was flooded, killing everyone inside. Like Tarbeck Hall, the standing structure was burned down, so both families went extinct. The way Tywin handled the Tarbeck Rain Rebellion earned him a reputation of his own. A song was even written called The Reigns of Castamere that remind others what the Lions of Lannister are capable of. <laughs> This song was what made Catelyn Stark realize what was going on during the Red Wedding. Tywin's childhood friend Aerys II became the next Targaryen to sit on the throne soon after. His first decision as king was to select Tywin as his hand, making him the youngest to take on this role at 20 years old. He was a man who took a house from near ruin to one of the most feared and respected families in the Seven Kingdoms. Selecting Tywin was a no-brainer. He wasn't the only Lannister in King's Landing, however. His cousin Joanna was Queen Rael Targaryen's companion and lady-in-waiting. It wouldn't be long before the Lannister cousins would be wed. Back at Castle Rock, things were still going smoothly even with Titos in charge. People wouldn't soon forget what happens if you defy the Lannisters. 
Titos would have a heart attack when going up some stairs to see his new mistress. Taiwan returned home after hearing the news, but found the mistress trying on his late mother's clothes. He then found out that she had been trying to run the show by bossing everyone around, wearing his mother's jewels while only being a lowborn mistress. Taiwan had her parade the streets naked and then exiled from the Westerlands. Around this same time, Joanna would give birth to twins, Jamie and Cersei. Their next child, who came a few years later, came out with some deformities, and Joanna wouldn't survive this delivery. Tywin was not one to laugh, considering his father's reputation, but he didn't smile much either. It was Joanna who was only able to make him smile and laugh at a couple occasions, but he would never do so again after her death. He blamed Tyrion for what happened to her, and has hated him since the moment he was born, but his sense of duty still remained. Even with Ares II and Tywin growing further apart, they were once friends but animosity between them was growing. Before his madness crept in, his only real flaw was his pride. He hated that Tywin was getting all the credit for how well the Seven Kingdoms were doing. People whispered that it was Tywin doing all the ruling, and this drove them apart. While Tywin was doing all the tireless work, Ares was constantly coming up with ambitious schemes to better the realm that he quickly grew bored of, and ended up accomplishing nothing. Ares began to do things just to spite Tywin and make his life more difficult, and also stopped taking his advice. With all the good work he was doing as the Hand, he was becoming more and more respected by many, but still, very few liked him. He was humorless and unforgiving, and slightly on the cruel side. As Tywin was drifting further away from his old friend Ares, his only true companion left was his brother Kevin. Tywin has always been close with Kevin and his sister Jenna, even though it was more out of duty than love, but Tywin didn't have a very good relationship with his other brothers. Kevin always understood that Tywin was the man in charge, and served dutifully as his right-hand man. Tygett hated living in the shadow of his accomplished brother, so he wanted to do his own thing, but he could never be Tywin, and this bothered him. Jirion was everything his oldest brother wasn't. He was always laughing and making others laugh. He was Jaime and Tyrion's favorite uncle. Tygett and Jirion died before the start of the series, and while Jenna is alive and fine in the books, she was cut from Game of Thrones. We saw Kevin here and there before his death in the show. Ares always lusted over Tywin's wife Joanna. It probably has a lot to do with her being Tywin's wife and not to do with Joanna. He was known to make inappropriate remarks towards her, and some believed there was something between them. Ares was known to have many mistresses, but would quickly lose interest in them. His lust for Joanna, however, went on for years. She was in King's Landing to serve Queen Rhaella, and one day Joanna was sent back to Castle Rock after Rhaella said she wouldn't have her king make mistresses out of her ladies. Just to hurt Tywin's reputation, Ares had raised the tolls for all the ports in the Seven Kingdoms and blamed it on Tywin. He took all the praise after lowering them back. Ares was playing a sick game with his hand. When he made comments about Joanna's body after having the twins, Tywin actually attempted to resign from his position, but Ares refused and he remained his hand for some more years. Their friendship only truly died when Ares made comments about Tywin's misshapen newborn son Tyrion. While Tywin was away grieving after his wife's death, Ares said, The gods cannot abide such arrogance. They have plucked a fair flower from his hand and given him a monster in her place to teach him some humility at last. And with it being King's Landing, it wouldn't take long for his remarks to reach Castle Rock. But even then, Tywin worked diligently without showing any emotion. After King Ares and Rhaella were finally able to have their second child Viserys, after many failed pregnancies and births, Tywin decided to throw a tourney to celebrate at Castle Rock. Many thought this was to reconcile their broken relationship, but Tywin was a schemer and a calculating bad. He always had ambitious goals for his children. Cersei would be Queen of the Seven Kingdoms, and Jaime a knight and the Lord of Castle Rock. But the Mad King took that away from Tywin. During the tourney where Prince Rhaegar fought well, but lost in the final tilt against Arthur Dayne, Tywin suggested it was time for the 17-year-old Rhaegar to marry. With Ares being in high spirits, Tywin offered Cersei to be his wife and the future queen. He also asked to make the young Jaime Rhaegar's squire since Rhaegar was recently knighted. Both offers were bluntly rejected. Rhaegar would marry Elia Martell and his squires would be from men who were no friends to Tywin and had been kissing the king's ass for a while. Ironically enough, Elia Martell and her younger brother Oberyn were expected to marry to the Lannister twins Cersei and Jaime. It was the Princess of Dorne and Joanna who negotiated this betrothal, but Joanna died before these plans became a reality. Tywin told the Princess of Dorne, who was Elia and Oberyn's mother, that Cersei would one day marry Rhaegar and offer Tyrion to Elia instead of Jaime, which was seen as an insult. King Aerys' mental state was worsening over the years. He was even growing suspicious of his wife and heir Rhaegar but it wouldn't be until an event called the Defiance of Duskendale where he would become the Mad King. In 277 AC, about 20 years before the start of the story, 
Lord Dennis Darklin of Duskendale, would destroy his own house and Ares' sanity. Duskendale was once a powerful port city before the Targaryens built King's Landing nearby. Dennis Darklin wanted to end its decline of power by lowering port fees and taxes to increase more traffic into his city. Tywin refused his proposition, so Dennis in return refused to pay his taxes to the crown as a form of protest and to get their attention. Dennis requested King Aerys come to Duskendale to work out their problems, which Tywin strongly advised against. At this point in their relationship, Aerys would do the opposite of whatever his hand thought was best for the realm. So he marched Duskendale with a small party to solve his problem on his own. He wanted to prove to everyone he was the man in charge and not his hand. This was a trap however and the king was captured. If any attempt to break the city walls were made, Lord Darklin promised it would cost the king's life. For six months, Tao and his army waited outside the walls while Aerys stayed imprisoned. Tywin wouldn't negotiate with Dennis, instead only repeat his demand to free the king. With all the Duskendale's food and goods cut off, things weren't looking good for them. Tywin demanded one last time to free the king or he would put everyone within the city to the sword. The messenger was a bard who played the reigns of Castamere to really set this mood. Many advised against storming the city since the king would likely be killed. He may or may not, Tywin Lannister reportedly replied, but if he does, we have a better king right here whereupon he raised a hand to indicate Prince Rhaegar. Tywin's army didn't attack, nor did Lord Darklin surrender the king. Sir Barristan Selmy of the Kingsguard believed he could secretly make his way to where Ares was being held and save him. And somehow, this badass pulled off this insane mission. From then on, the Mad King believed Tywin wanted him dead. He didn't want him as his hand, but believed that dismissing him would lead to Tywin killing him. In 281 AC, a spot opened up in the Kingsguard, and the Mad King selected the 15-year-old Jaime Lannister to fill that empty spot. While well, this was amazing news for Jaime, who had always dreamed of becoming a famous knight and had no interest in marrying since it was Cersei who he loved, Tywin was furious. His heir was taken from him, just like how his plans to make Cersei a queen were foiled by the Mad King. But like always, Tywin kept his composure and thanked the king for this honor. He then left his position as the Hand, claiming he was ill, and this time Ares happily let him go. He now had his treasured son by his side, as someone of a hostage, even if Jaime didn't realize it. Cersei, who was living at the Red Keep for a while, went back to Castle Rock with her father. This would be the last time Tywin would ever see Ares. They were once so close that Ares requested it be Tywin who knighted him after the War of the Nine Penny Kings. Without Tywin's knowledge, the twins were purposely separated by Joanna after they were caught by a servant at a young age being inappropriate with each other. Joanna threatened to tell their father if they ever did that again, but she never did and died soon afterwards. With Jaime now a member of the Kingsguard, Tyrion became the new heir of Castle Rock. To make matters worse, Tywin had negotiated a betrothal in which Jaime would marry Lysa Tully, which would be an advantageous match. It wouldn't be easy finding a match for Tyrion, even if he was the heir to Castle Rock and all its gold. The family's line would have to pass down Tyrion's line since Jaime vowed to father no children. Two years later, in 283 AC, Tyrion would come across a common girl being harassed by some men. Tyrion was traveling with Jaime on a lonely road near Lannisport, which is the biggest city in the Westerlands. Jaime scared off the harassers, and Tyrion comforted her. Tyrion and the common girl named Taisha would fall in love and marry when he was only 13. This was without his father's knowledge and blessing. Tywin only saw the common girl as a gold digger who was after the family's fortune, and ordered Jaime, who Tyrion loved and trusted, to put an end to this disgraceful marriage. Jaime was to tell Tyrion that Taisha was just a whore he hired to take Tyrion's virginity, because he believed it was time to become a man. Jaime told him that running into her on the road and being rescued was just an act. Tywin gave Taisha to his guards and had each of them sleep with her. One silver coin was paid for each man. Tywin was given a golden coin by his father and was told to sleep with her last and then pay her. A Lannister is worth more, but she actually was who Tyrion thought she was. Their love was real and all the guards that gave her a silver coin were actually raping her. Tyrion would only find out the truth about this in the third book many years later when Jaime is freeing him from his death sentence. Tyrion is in a fit of rage, but in the show, all of this was cut out. Jaime and Tyrion have a heartfelt goodbye. When the Mad King requested the Westerlands support during Robert's Rebellion, Tywin was quiet and remained neutral while in Castle Rock. Tywin wouldn't dare join Robert's cause and put Jaime at risk. While the majority of the Kingsguard were out fighting the war regarding Lyanna and Dorne, Jaime stood by the Mad King's side. Only when the war was nearly over and it was clear the Targaryens lost, did Tywin show up. The gates to King's Landing were all closed, but Grandmaster Pycelle convinced the Mad King to open them for Tywin and his men, claiming they were here to support him. 
Pycelle has always been very loyal to Tywin because of his leadership skills, even though a maester should only serve the realm and never take sides. Tywin sacked the city, and when the Mad King wanted to destroy all of King's Landing with wildfire scattered across the city, Jaime killed him to prevent the catastrophe. In order to prove his loyalty to the new King Robert Baratheon, Tywin had Rhaegar's two young children killed so they wouldn't deal with a rebellion in the future. Tywin knew that Robert wouldn't want to dirty his own hands by doing this horrible act, so he would appreciate someone else becoming the villain who had the babies killed. And he was right, Robert made Tywin's dream of his daughter becoming a queen a reality. The Lannister name was tarnished because of Tywin and Jaime's final acts during the war, but they became more powerful than they ever had been in the new superpower of the Seven Kingdoms. After the war, it was just Tywin and Tyrion in Castle Rock, with the other two siblings living at the Red Keep in King's Landing. On Tyrion's 16th birthday, his desire to travel and see the world like others before him have done was shut down by Tywin. He didn't want Tyrion to bring any more shame to their house. His gift to his son was giving him charge of all the sewers and drains of Castle Rock. It may have been an insult, but Tyrion would excel and prove his worth, something that Tywin would never see or appreciate. Tywin never remarried after Joanna, even though she died when they were both still fairly young. But we learn from Tywin's last moments that he took in at least one whore, when acting like he was way above that. Tywin had many enemies he earned throughout his life, but it would be Tyrion to bring an end to him. He could never love his son that till the moment he died blamed for his wife's death. Tyrion was psychologically damaged after the events surrounding his first wife Tysha. When Tyrion learns that Tysha truly loved him and was not a whore, he asks Tywin where she went afterwards. His response of wherever whores go continues to haunt Tyrion. Tywin referring to her as a whore was the final straw that made Tyrion loosen the crossbow bolt and kill his own father. The Great Lion died at the age of 58, and House Lannister that he worked so hard to make prosper is already crumbling. I left out some of the details between the Mad King and Tywin because I think I'm going to make one of these videos for Ares II, and possibly even for Jaime. Hope you enjoyed this one guys, and I'll be back soon. Thanks for watching.